Hello, everybody, and welcome to our practical introduction to sourcing optimization. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I highly appreciate that. And uh, I hope you're going to enjoy the next 45 minutes. My name is Fabian. I am responsible for marketing and procurement here at Archlib. And um, I have spent the last 10 years in procurement as a global category manager and then as a procurement consultant. And um, I will use uh, the knowledge that I obtained over that time uh, to give you a little bit of an insight into uh, the, the world of procurement technology as well as sourcing optimization. So what do we want to, um, oh, that's the beautiful Switzerland where I am today. But what I want to um, talk to you about today is actually two, three things. Um, we have decided to offer this session because the procurement technology space, first of all, is expanding massively. Uh, it has grown over the last four or five years uh, at a pace that has been unprecedented. And so it's sometimes a little bit intimidating if that's not what you deal with on a daily basis. So that's the first thing. The second one is that sourcing optimization, so the space that we operate in, is such a niche space within that, that most people have even never heard of it or have just not a good understanding of what it actually is or does or can do for you. And so therefore, um, we really want to offer this session and we call it edutainment. Uh, so we hope you have fun uh, learning about it to help you navigate it and uh, to really feel more comfortable when people are throwing some terminology around. We want you to um, really understand what optimization can do for you and why that's something that you might want to consider going forward. And then lastly, we want to really use some practical use cases um, that, that, that we use with our clients um, and where we see a lot of value, because that's the, the practical part that oftentimes when you only talk about technology gets a little bit lost on the wayside. So um, those are the topics. We have a Q&A functionality in Zoom, so it works exactly as in a normal Zoom meeting. Throughout the session, please feel free to actually um, yeah, ask questions, raise questions. Uh, Tim, one of our co-founders, is monitoring the Q&A. And uh, if he will not answer, or if we will not answer them throughout the session, we have a, a, session for, or a section for Q&A at the very end. So with that, let's jump into it. And let's start by talking about procurement technology. When people talk about procurement technology, they often start talking about slides full of boxes with logos over logos over logos. And as much as I love these, um, they are sometimes a little bit confusing because you, yeah, it's, it's hard to navigate them. It's really hard to understand, okay, so how are they connected? What's going on here? And um, if you're not really uh, into the scene and if into this topic, then it becomes even harder. Then it's just a literally a bunch of logos um, thrown around. And so therefore, that's a little bit of a challenge. As I said, I love those because they're great for market research. They're great for actually understanding the complexity of the space. But to really unfold their full power, you might have to uh, take a little bit of a different angle um, at them. And that's what we want to look at today. The second thing that I think is really sad about those, well, it's actually not sad about those, but it's sad that I have to say it, is that the most powerful tools in business, in procurement, they are not on those maps, never, ever. These are the tools that everybody loves and everybody uses all the time. No matter if you're a small organization and you only have 20 people, or if you're a multinational, global, multi-billion company with hundreds of people in procurement. Those are the tools that are actually ruling the game. And uh, I don't know if you've heard, but yesterday Microsoft has acquired uh, a provider in Spend Analytics. So maybe they will change that a little bit now and uh, get in here as well. But um, that's not really the, the problem here. Um, we're talking about digitalization and these tools, even though they have digitalized some, uh, some tasks, they are not digital in the sense that we want to think about. Um, they are actually rather uh, helping the world to think in data silos and to be more disconnected because Excel files just don't talk to each other. Even if you put all of them into the same SharePoint, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you have connected data. And so for me, that's a problem. And I'm using now this, uh, this example from sourcing with Excel, uh, but you could basically just replace uh, sourcing here with any of those other terms because would be very, very similar, right? Uh, yes, it's true. 
most people feel comfortable. They know how to navigate. It's, you know, it's flexible, so they can play around with that. And so there's a lot of good things and it's very powerful tools, but I, for myself, I know a fraction of the things that Excel, uh, Excel is capable of. And so therefore, I'm definitely not a pro. And the other problem, on, and I think that's a real problem here, is it's very manual and tedious. And so you have to start over every single time you have a new project, you have a new round within the same tender, copy, paste, repeat, right? And then you filter and you have this very binary view of the world of like, ah, no, fell through the, fell through the cracks. And so that's, that's gone. Um, so that's, that's really the challenge that I see. And you can really collaborate uh, with people. I mean, there is online Excel, but I mean, I don't know if you've used that, but I think it's again, not necessarily what comes to mind when I talk about collaboration. But what's even worse is, as I said earlier as well, you don't learn from it. You don't learn from your own experience because you don't usually look at your old projects uh, necessarily. You definitely don't learn from others. You definitely don't get this community perspective of how things could be solved. And if I jump in front of a bus tomorrow, all of my knowledge will be lost. And so that's a big problem as well because data retention is such a big challenge in itself that having these kind of tools, these kind of uh, frameworks just adds to that problem. So coming back to this picture now, and again, I cannot stress enough that I love them uh, because I'm a little bit of a nerd when it comes to this tech market. For me, they really provide a very, very positive message. And that's why I, I, I truly love them. For every capability in procurement, there's somebody somewhere out there that is working on changing this disconnectedness. And that's the cool part about it because I like to look at it now more from, a, from an application lens and from a process lens to really connect those dots. And I think that's the message that I wanna um, bring here today that changing it to looking at uh, procurement technology from a process angle might feel a little bit old fashioned and a little bit of a simplified way, but it's also very powerful because it helps you structure these kind of thoughts. Um, and so that's why I would say, let's talk a little bit about the terminology that people use when talking about procurement technology before we now um, actually connect those dots and dive a little bit deeper into sourcing specifically. So what we look at here right now is what people call the source to setup process. So really the end to end process. And within that, we have the plan to strategy part where you talk about spend analytics, category management, the pipeline and savings management. Then you have source to contract, which is like in the middle and where it's sourcing in terms of the tender management auctions this is also where optimization sits um, or contingent workforce management. And then you have contracting with uh, the repository or life cycle management and uh, offering capabilities. And then downstream from that, you have pay, purchase to pay, where you have purchasing catalogs, marketplaces, invoice management, uh, or AP automation. So that's the, the kind of pieces that sit within this source to sell. And underneath that, and this is where now um, is interesting, we have supplier relationship management. And it sits underneath and across because it has obviously uh, points that connect to all of those above, right? So from the spend analytics part to sourcing, who do I invite actually to purchasing from those guys, right? And then also data. And I think that's the most exciting uh, over the recent uh, months and years now, again, sits across and underneath because it intersects again in multiple different spaces just to make sure that mostly supplier related information can be fed in to enrich the decision process. So it could be sustainability information from Ecovades or risk management uh, stuff from risk methods or somebody like that, um, or I don't know, benchmark information or parts information. Um, like, you know, like there's loads of use cases. And so I think this is really the, the, the interesting part, but that's the terminology people use. And when they now talk about the uh, procurement providers, then there's these two, these two camps. There's like the best of breed approach, which is when you only offer one or a few of those capabilities, or you're a suite provider that offers services and capabilities across the entire process. And hybrid is basically everything in between. So enhancing a suite through integrations with best of breed providers is a hybrid model. And I think that's what we see nowadays mostly and uh, what we would probably 
continue to see over uh, over the next uh, couple of years. So for me, this is important to understand and to, to, to really have clear because it's the foundation of these conversations, right? But before we now um, yeah, jump into these, uh, these supplier maps, we still need to think about another aspect uh, when, we, when we think about our digitalization journey. So we basically, and I think that's the part that we usually don't find uh, in organizations, you really need to understand first what is it that you want to accomplish? And what is the use case that you actually want to cover? Because when people come to us and say, hey, can you integrate with this? And you ask them, why? Then that's a, good, that's a very valid question, right? That's something that people need to answer. They need to be able to actually have a clear understanding of why do I want to connect two things? Uh, there needs to be value in that. And what it comes down to is really the flow of information across this process and throughout all of these different um, capabilities. That's the part um, that is most exciting and where we see the, the biggest change and where we with sourcing optimization that we now want to um, dive in actually think uh, it's, a, it's a good piece to connect those different things and really have these upstream, these downstream, as well as all of these data enriched kind of components to extend your decision making. So that's basically what I wanted to share as uh, an intro to the procurement technology market with you. Um, if there's no questions so far, then um, actually let's let's go into optimization. Um, in optimization, I think um, before we dive into the definition of that, again, there's uh, this picture that I really like, and uh, there's. There's, there's uh, other people that compete with us in these markets that have similar slides because I think it, also loads of uh, consultancies because I think it's a super powerful message. For all of the capabilities that we've uh, seen before, there's different levels of maturity. And now again, this is an example for sourcing. You could paint one uh, for all of the other capabilities as well. On the very left side, you basically have level one, not digitalized. So we usually talk about doing everything with Excel and Outlook, as I mentioned earlier. And then on the far right, you have this uh, kind of autonomous sourcing, which is like very advanced, right? And um, I would say over the last two years, uh, some people have made great streaks into that direction. And uh, so therefore that's, that's fantastic. And that's where we will ultimately move for many things. But the reality is, that many people haven't mastered level one. So we see most organizations to sit somewhere between level one and two. So they either have implemented a solution, but then don't use it uh, as intended, or they don't have anything at all. And I mean, considering that this technology has been around for 25, almost 30 years now, that's quite astonishing that that's the kind of level uh, we usually find. And sourcing optimization is kind of the pathway now towards more autonomous sourcing. Um, because it connects or combines the capabilities of, uh, of e-sourcing and e-auctions, but adds this layer of uh, advanced analytics and optimization capabilities that are ultimately um, the starting point for you to collect information of how people behave and to then make recommendations on or guidance on how they actually should behave or what they should consider. And so therefore, it's a maturity um, chart and you know, like people have to go through it, but you can leapfrog basically from level one to level three. One to five, I think would be very difficult, but one to three is something that you can very easily do. And I think that's the part that I find uh, most interesting here. But when we now bring it back to what is sourcing optimization exactly, then I've tried to put in this kind of uh, simple definition that sourcing optimization describes the process of solving complex mathematical allocation problems with powerful computers using a combination of advanced linear and nonlinear mathematical models. Okay, so what does that mean actually, right? So I try to underline these two aspects that I would like to focus on. The one is about complexity and we will talk about that later um, and complexity and allocation problems. So an allocation problem is basically when you think about math and uh, you want to solve for X um, or X and Y. So those are the kind of uh, allocation problems and the complexity comes in from large amounts of information here in our case in procurement, like supplier bits, 
multiple items, cost breakdowns, uh, additional information, all of that kind of stuff that's adding complexity. And then the second part is uh, the, the, the mathematical optimization. Actually, here I want to talk more about what it enables us to do, and that's scenario-based thinking. It's a term that comes from the military from the 90s, from the US, I think. But um, now in this kind of context, what it actually means is that we can iterate all of those different possible options of how we could solve. And that helps us now to, to come up with the best solution for a problem. And because again, like this all sounds very theoretical and uh, yeah, dry. And I think that's why I'm super happy that so many people have signed up and are joining us today. If you think about um, Google Maps, then that's actually a very, very good analogy for this kind of concept. So if I want to go from Paris to Berlin, there's hundreds of different routes that I could possibly take. And I can either take now the shortest, I can take the most scenic, I can take the one that is fastest. And throughout this, I can bring in all of these different things like, oh, I want to, I want to avoid toll roads. I don't want to stand in traffic. Um, I actually want to take the train instead. So, you know, like all of these different options is what we call, um, yeah, what, what you can basically consider as a mathematical allocation problem. Because throughout all of these hundreds of routes, now Google actually helps you find your way from A to B. And that's what sourcing optimization does for procurement and for tenders. On top of that, I think, um, like this kind of idea of these different um, yeah, options that you want to bring in is super important to me because procurement sometimes has this kind of, uh, yeah, well, people have this idea that procurement is only interested in price, which I think everybody in procurement thinks is wrong, but uh, it's nevertheless the perception and perception is reality. So we're not really countering that because when we go to stakeholders, we often talk about exactly that and we don't really have the means to bring in many other things. but. What I believe in is that our decision should be holistic and that we should incorporate loads of different pieces of information. Um, and as an example that we like to use, like we've talked about sustainability earlier. And uh, you know, like that's such a hot topic that we've been working on as well for quite some time. But those information similar to our chart with the Microsoft tools earlier, often live in isolation. And so they need to actually be brought in. The same is true for risk. The same is true for your benchmarks, your historical information. And the same is true for your supplier performance or qualification information. Those are all pieces of information that today often sit in isolation or they are simply not considered when it actually matters throughout the sourcing process. And so that's why I believe that holistic sourcing decisions enabled by optimization can be a very powerful way for us to actually um, give people more insights and to actually think in scenarios. And so that brings us back to this idea of scenarios. So I talked about business rules and constraints in our journey from Paris to Berlin, but in procurement, the constraints are basically come from somewhere else. They're either coming from ourselves, from within procurement, like for example, we want to have only number of X suppliers in our, uh, in our ward, or we want to spread the risk across multiple people, or we want to um, only consider preferred suppliers or the income, whatever, right? So procurement is basically coming up with those rules that need to be considered or fulfilled in our equation. But then the stakeholders have preferences as well. They actually um, don't want to have change. So they would love to see what, I only want to work with the guys that I've been working with uh, for the last 10 years. Um, or they only want to or feel comfortable with a certain number of changes that you make to the way you've always done things. And then there's a third um, area and that's the suppliers itself or the external uh, perspective. Because when you want to buy a hundred tons of something but a supplier can only deliver 60, then there's obviously a limitation in that or somebody is only operating in Europe and you're looking for Europe and North America. So, you know, like those are limitations that are more externally driven. And when you now look at all of these different constraints and put them together, then each combination of them is basically a scenario. And we see, uh, you know, like, and by, by 
having all of these different scenarios and putting them next to each other, we can now actually see, okay, what are our options? What does it mean if I do A over B? And so that's the part that um, so far people have done in a certain way um, to a certain degree, but it's something that is uh, rather cumbersome if you do it in Excel. And if you only think about now uh, a simple scenario, like for example, you wanna limit the number of suppliers and you only want to include preferred suppliers, then each of them is already like a handful of different scenarios because you would have to do one for one supplier, one for two suppliers, one for three suppliers, now one with only preferred suppliers and one with only preferred suppliers across one, two or three and so on and so on. And all of a sudden we're talking about six, seven, eight different scenarios just from bringing in something as simple as I wanna limit the number of suppliers. And we're not talking about bringing in now sustainability, bringing in risk diversification ideas or any of those kind of things. And I think that's now the power of having something like uh, sourcing optimization tools, because with those, building these scenarios becomes actually quite straightforward. And because it's straightforward and, uh, and easy to do, it's also something that we can very quickly and easily discuss with our stakeholders. So we can actually show them what does it mean if I want to have the most sustainable versus the lowest cost versus the most diverse kind of uh, selection? And we can actually then see what's the difference in price. And so now all of a sudden, we understand what is the opportunity cost of doing something one way or the other. And it's this opportunity cost that I personally think really helps us improve our relationship, both with the suppliers, but especially with our stakeholders, because we can now say, hey, you can save 2 million or 5 million or 50 million or whatever the number, if you actually release that kind of restriction. And I've seen it over and over that when I said to people, well, if you work with four suppliers rather than just three suppliers, you can save 2 million. It's a very, very strong argument for them to reconsider how important that constraint is. And again, I'm using these rather simple ones now um, because they are very, yeah, they're, Everybody in every uh, industry and every kind of uh, um, spend category can relate to that kind of challenge, but you can obviously build in whatever you please. And uh, you can basically now drill into all of this and see what is the cost of all of these individual pieces and what does it mean if I actually relax that. So I think this is really the part that for me in sourcing optimization is quite unique and really powerful to drive savings and uh, yeah, in a, in, in a very efficient way, I would say. Fabian, we had, we had a few questions, um, but I think one, it makes sense to take now, which was how do you actually quantify most sustainable? That's a very good question. Um, thanks for that. So most sustainable here is now obviously, um, yeah, just something again to pick up on the words because sustainability is such a hot topic. But as I tried to um, say earlier, and uh, let me maybe just jump back here quickly. One of the things that we do is we work with, uh, with partners like Ecobatis. So Ecobatis is obviously then in charge of making sure to do all of those assessments and um, provide the scoring on their different parameters. And we're just using those parameters and based on what it is that you're trying to accomplish, you could basically create a scenario that says, well, I only want to work with people now um, that have, uh, let's say, the best labor conditions or something like that. You know, like Equivalis has a couple of different uh, things that they measure on. And so you could use all of those scores. But you can go a lot further. And we have written a white paper on that um, a while ago that you can find on our website. Uh, on more category specific metrics that might not actually be industry standards, but something that you for your organization have to find. Or you can think of something like um, CO2 emissions, where in a logistics tender, you could say, well, which kind of approach uh, between road and intermodal or train gives me the, the lowest kind of CO2 emissions, for example, like that. So, and that would be your most sustainable scenario. So it really depends on what it is that you're trying to accomplish in your specific category to now say what actually sustainable means, but it's just these kind of ideas. You can bring in whatever information you have that you want to reduce and optimize for. Um, another one that we see quite often is, for example, packaging weight. 
um, because by the reduction of packaging weight, we also reduce our CO2 emissions. So those are different examples of how users um, actually optimize for sustainability and make data that usually would just, again, sit somewhere very actionable and uh, allow them to have a conversation on that. I hope that helps. Anything else for now or should we move on? We can continue for now. Okay, cool. So, okay, um, just to uh, really stress it again, uh, by having this ability to now identify these opportunity costs, I really think that we can improve our relationships with people and really show them the options that they have and therefore have more meaningful discussions with them, uh, both suppliers as well as internal stakeholders. And now to conclude this kind of intro to um, optimization and how it works, I basically just wanted to give you a quick view of what are the different capabilities that sourcing optimization tools or advanced sourcing tools or whatever they are called um, bring to the table that others uh, do not have. And I think they can be clustered into these three different buckets, event design, event analysis, and event optimization. Um, where in design, standard tools often have limitations in how many items or how many cost breakdowns or how many suppliers they can manage without you know, um, all of a sudden the system being very shaky. Um, and uh, so therefore, you know, like this kind of limitations, they just fall away. You have complete flexibility in terms of the number of uh, pieces of information and items that you wanna collect, the number of uh, SQs or line items, the number of suppliers you wanna have. Uh, you actually can allow people like suppliers in this case uh, to give alternative quotes and bids uh, on specific items that you request. You can allow them to factor in um, discounts and uh, rebates and let them model all of that. And as I said earlier, you can really now bring in this kind of third party information. Uh, so I think those are the parts that, uh, that I find most interesting for the, for the event designers. It goes beyond above and beyond the, the standards. You know, like you obviously can still do your RF, IRF, X uh, auction, and so on and so forth. And then in analysis, I think here it's really the, um, the there's some cool capabilities in terms of data validation and outlier detection. So things that in a manual way you have to do yourself uh, every single time. The tools are programmed in a way that they actually help you to find. Where has somebody messed around with your bid sheet? Where has somebody not filled in information or where has somebody maybe filled in the wrong thing? Um, and so you can very quickly now get efficiency from seeing where's the problem and help people fix that. Uh, so I say it, it, it happens in real time because it literally happens in a couple of seconds and the same is true for outlier detection. So, you know, um, in a multi-stage tender, usually the first round is a little bit like, mm, because people are like all over the place. And now the system actually tells you and can help the suppliers to also understand that eh, I'm out of range. So this doesn't actually help. And then what I think also the other cool part about the analysis is if you now do a second round and if you now um, have some changes in your event setup, like again, the analysis is still real time. So it still incorporates all of those changes quickly and you do need to now start to build a new analysis file, let's say. It's, it, it's happening automatically because it happens in the system and not in an Excel sheet. So those are the things in analysis that I find uh, really, really, really interesting actually. And then optimization, I think we talked about a little bit. Um, there's obviously, you can, you can provide a lot of feedback so you can tell people how do they perform on a very detailed level. So um, where previously, because of our limitations and you don't wanna spend five hours with every single supplier to say on a hundred items, this is how you perform on this line. This is how you perform here. With these tools, you can be very efficient in providing feedback in a very, very granular level on all of the inputs rather than just the price. And I think, again, this is something that is super powerful as part of your negotiation strategy to really make sure that throughout the different tender rounds, you can guide people towards your optimal uh, kind of starting point for a negotiation. And then as we uh, looked at the scenarios, if it's very easy to create scenarios, then you very quickly can now create three, five, 10, 15 that are relevant to you and understand what changes between them. And you can, again, have a very clear view on, okay, how far am I away from my target scenario and what I actually would love to accomplish? 
So those are the things that I find are most interesting in terms of the capabilities that you simply don't find in the standard uh, RFX tool, basically. So that's it in terms of the technology perspective. And I would now move on to um, yeah, more of a, a use case uh, perspective, uh, unless there's any questions at this point. We can, I think we can move them to the back to the end. Yeah, okay, perfect. Cool. So then um, let's stop the theory, talk about some practical stuff here. And again, there's two aspects I would like to actually look at with you. One of them is complexity, and then the other one is uh, applicability. So when we start with complexity, um, I think this is really interesting again, because in the conversations that we have with people, people usually come to us and say, I don't need this. My world isn't that complex. And so that means when we now roll back a bit, what is complexity? Where does it actually come from? And so I, I, I like to use this pyramid because people think of it usually in this kind of shape, right? We have this very top where we have this very small amount of tenders that are highly complex. There's so much going on that, you know, like somebody is underwater for five months, eight months, whatever, uh, because they're so complex and they have to copy and paste so much stuff all the time. And then you have this other extreme, which is the tail where everybody's like, yeah, don't have time for it. It's not really changing the needle. So therefore um, let's ignore that. And that can be, you know, 5,000 for somebody and 250,000 for another organization. But whatever it is, it's the two ends of the extreme. And there's a world in between that, that people simply ignore because they think it's not that complex. I can fix it. I can handle it myself. And that's the part where I would say, I would challenge you on that. Because what is it that actually drives complexity? And so I've just put together this small list of items of different things that are actually drivers of complexity. And it's true, if you only have three items, uh, uh, one item and three suppliers, you don't need some advanced analytics to figure out what's, uh, yeah, what's the best way to go about that, even if you wanna do scenarios, like that's pretty straightforward. But if you have five items or even three items and three suppliers, things already start to change because modeling then what it means to also consider sustainability on top of that or risk on top of that already becomes quite a, yeah, quite a, quite a feat, I would say. But the reality actually is that it's usually not just one thing that people add on top, but it's multiple. So it can either be multiple items or it can be multiple suppliers. It can be multiple award options or splits that we could possibly do. It can be all of these additional decision criteria, like as we discussed, diversity, sustainability, risk. It could be the, the stakeholder restriction or the supplier restrictions that we discussed earlier. Or it can even be, um, yeah, these more geographic uh, kind of restrictions, or you have multiple services that you want to put together. And so, you know, like all of these different things um, happen all the time. But as soon as you have two of them, I would argue having a strong analytics capability makes your life a lot easier. And so I think that's the part where, where we really try to help people see that there's value for analytics in a much broader area than just the top of the pyramid. I think that's where people really miss out. So that's it from the perspective of the complexity. But now um, in terms of applicability, people also often come to us and say, well, in this category, I can see the benefit in others I don't. And there's obviously some that, um, yeah, that, that lend themselves more for it than others. But uh, to, to use that argument to say, I don't need it at all is very difficult. And we have uh, one client that has, uh, I think done over 35 different spend categories with us now already. Um, and so that's quite a massive number, right? Uh, for any organization. So therefore I think um, the applicability is really given everywhere because this is about a data perspective and analyzing data um, and not what actually the, the item name says, right? That's obviously important. And so those kind of more softer capabilities can be factored in, in the same fashion that you can factor in sustainability or anything else. But nevertheless, uh, it's more a data perspective than anything else. And what people tell us uh, that use the tool, uh, or, and I, I know that it's the same for other tools as well, they can really increase their efficiency. So they can cut it in half. Um, some people even go up to 90%. The truth is probably somewhere 
in between there. But even if it's 50%, I would say that's quite a quite a massive improvement, especially in organizations um, that are challenged that there's too much going on and they don't have enough time uh, to do that. The other thing people say is uh, that they can also generate quite a large amount of savings, um, somewhere between eight to 10%, I would say on average. But again, with averages in raw materials, that's obviously a number you will probably not achieve. Whereas in professional services is something that you can yeah, go a lot further than that. So that's why I think, again, independent of industries, independent of spend categories, but nevertheless, there's a couple of categories that are really powerful and where we see a lot of this uh, adoption. And that is uh, on the one hand side, logistics and warehousing. I think that's the prime example that everybody uh, uses because everybody knows that it's complicated with different, uh, uh, yeah, uh, different um, transportation methods like road or uh, rail or ship or air. And then you have pallets, you have warehousing and all of those things. Usually there's quite a large number of items that you need to um, yeah, work through. And so therefore it really is quite applicable here. And the same is true for packaging, which is the second big topic that I think all of our clients um, are using. Because again, loads of specifications, different materials, different options um, that you can possibly consider. There's so much going on that again, uh, people use this, uh, this kind of analytics capabilities quite a bit for packaging tenders. I think what is less known is this raw material ingredient space because those markets often are fairly restricted. And so it's a little bit harder to find a use case, but we have, we have sourced sugar, we have sourced flour, we have sourced vegetable oils, we have sourced sweeteners, and you know this list goes on. And I think the cool thing is that with all of those different uh, quality grades and, uh, and options that people can offer you, that's something that you usually just ignore a bit because it's not something that can fit in easily. But by giving the suppliers this opportunity to show them to you, you can now manage how many changes am I willing to make? Like what's the qualification period? And you can factor scenarios around those kind of ideas in your uh, total cost view. And so therefore, again, uh, an area that, uh, especially in the food and beverage industry is quite, quite powerful. And then my, my metier is usually more this professional services uh, or indirect space where in marketing, consulting, IT, legal, you know, everybody where they have rate cards, asset pricing, or um, kind of scope of works. Like, again, usually a lot of detail that people are interested in and that they want to compare. And if you run a global tender on, uh, on consulting or marketing agencies with different agency types or consulting types and different seniority levels, that can become quite messy. So if you have 30 markets with 20 agencies uh, each, that's a, low, that, that, that's a large number of, uh, of different just price points that you want to look at, um, not considering any of the other aspects. And then facility management, I think, is one of those prime examples, again, because uh, it's, it's just super fun because you have multiple services that can be done on a global, regional, uh, on a local, or on a site level, each service individually, all service together and you know like any combination kind of is possible and even though everybody might have a perspective on what it is that they would like to do and how they would like to do it now they would have the opportunity with these analytics capabilities to actually see what is the cost of that what's the trade-off and where is the cost difference coming from and so in a negotiation you can very much focus on okay these are the aspects where we can actually drive savings so again Within a couple of minutes, you can get to that. And then lastly, MO and CapEx, I think, again, that's where we usually see like the thousands of uh, spare parts uh, and stuff like that, or the personal protective equipment. But I've also seen um, like we build um, uh, production halls with conveyor belts, like across multiple sites with multiple pieces. So that's, uh, yeah, I think we, we did the math and there were like 90 million different options of how you could possibly award a project. And so it's like something where Excel just doesn't help you uh, with those. So I think there's a lot of different um, opportunities to apply advanced analytics and optimization and the scenario-based thinking um, to actually support you in your negotiation. But now that being said, I think, as always, when it comes to technology, there's two things that you need to keep in mind. There's obviously the technology side and what does technology do uh, in itself, 
like the, the map, for example, um, that's great, but it shouldn't be self-servicing, right? It shouldn't be just for the sake of it. And then there's this, how do you actually bring that to the people, that, that side of things? I think this is the part where you really see the difference then because like, um, it's great to have a lot of power, but if it takes a lot of power as well to apply it, then that, that's very limiting. And so that might mean you are limited to the top of the pyramid. Whereas if it's something that is very applicable and uh, approachable, then all of a sudden you can really open it up throughout the organization and enable a lot of people to get these powerful capabilities. And I think that's really the part where we focus to make sure that we get this into as many hands as possible in, in as easy as possible fashion so that organizations can drive this value. So that's it in terms of uh, the edutainment session for today. And just as I mentioned earlier, there's a couple of resources on our website um, that you can uh, find as well. Some more diving deeper into this topic of today. Um, I'm not sure if it's actually on there already today or if it's there next week, but uh, our, our guide to sourcing optimization is coming out. And then we have some webinar recordings and white papers on sustainability and how you can uh, apply those kind of um, scenarios and metrics in your decision making. So whoever's asked that question earlier, this might be an interesting read for you as well. So with that, um, we have a couple of minutes left for Q&A. Perfect. Um, I will just pick out a few um, from, from the Q&A section here. And actually something that already was asked very early on in the webinar uh, was, do you really think that sourcing optimization can be for the masses and why is it not yet adopted by more people? Which I think was a, an interesting question, but I didn't want to put it in earlier because first wanted you to go through everything from it. Yeah, I think that's a little bit coming back to what I just said about technology and how do you bring it to the people, right? So this technology has been around for 15 years, like um, trade extensions and so on, and then Taurus have been around for, for ages, right? But the technology is so powerful that you also need to be an expert almost to apply it and to really use it to your advantage. And I think that's for an average guy, an average procurement manager, that's just too much. They use it once in a while. And if it's then something where you need to be well-trained, um, edges of the challenge. And that's why mostly these kind of features are used by consultants, right? Uh, because then they get the practice in. And I think that's the part where if we manage now to make it so easy to use and so intuitive and maybe take some of those capabilities away, then all of a sudden we can reach a much broader audience because they're like, oh yeah, okay, I get this. So I think that's really the key to make it usable um, in a way that is more modern and intuitive, I would say. Perfect. Um, and someone also asked, um, how how is it if if they work with sap is there is there a way to integrate mm. yeah um, so i mean i obviously can only talk uh, about us now but um, when we talked about this technology landscape i think our model is that we have this open integration mindset and i mean like we have a partnership with sap directly now um, through their sap io program where we integrate with sap Riva and uh, Sporhana, but Obviously, like this, this, this can be applied to everybody. Like everybody who has a sourcing capability in place could now enhance it with a best of breed solution um, if they allow to do so in order to get these more advanced analytics capabilities. But we, as Archer, we definitely, um, yeah, are very open to integrate upstream down. So the only precondition is it must be a good use case. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily integrate with a spend analytics provider as of now. And someone asked, can you do an analysis based on several criteria? And the same person also asked, for example, with sustainability, but also only within preferred supplier grouping or cluster. Yeah, so um, you can. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a question of like, what do you want to optimize and what's more important to you? So but you can also you can have multiple objectives uh, that you want to optimize on. 
but one has to be the prevalent one in order for the map to make sense, I would say. But if you limit your kind of sustainability optimization on just your preferred suppliers, for example, then that's a very easy way. Um, so you just build a scenario that has these two rules. I only want to consider preferred suppliers and I want to optimize for CO2 or Aquavada score or whatever. So that's definitely something that's easily possible. Okay, I think we have time maybe for one last question because we're now at 45. Um, sure. Um, it was interesting that maybe I should answer now, otherwise I'm more than happy to um, yeah, answer this later. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 a few left, a few people asked about a demo, but I think um, it makes sense to just book that through the website. Okay. Um, and that's not so for here. Okay, so perfect. Then thank you very much for spending the time with us. I hope this was uh, really edutainment and you learned a little bit, but also had a little bit of fun um, doing so. Uh, if you have two minutes now after the webinar, please fill out our um, little survey that pops up after you close the window. That would be highly appreciated. And uh, if there's anything else, uh, yeah, just reach out to me. Um, you can find my email address very, very easily or otherwise just by our contact uh, forms. So again, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you and have a wonderful evening, okay?